So, it's been some time. I was writing a script about problematic things. And then Joyce came along and started a separate script about things we have to recommend. I finished that script, and the end result of that process was a great incoherent mess. So I'm taking it from the top. First thing we have to talk about today is Moonshine. Moonshine is a Dojin visual novel produced by the now seemingly dissolved Dojin circle, Sakura Mint, whose origins I don't have the resources nor Japanese language knowledge to trace much information about. It was released in 2007, and then translated to English in 2008, and quite frankly, the fact that a freely available English translation exists for easy online downloading is a goddamn miracle. It's really short, like about an hour, or two, if you're slow, like we are. Nonetheless, this VN made us cry like a little baby child. The reason for that being, it's about a trans girl. And the other reason for that being, it's about a trans girl falling in love with a gender-ambiguous main protagonist who is, well, gosh, really. This is a really raw and emotionally powerful little story with a really strong theme of how to move on with your life. From a life where you didn't belong or weren't loved, or from a life that you love but that can't follow you, and how either can be equally painful, how change is always painful, even if it truly is for the better, and it's just a whole lot of feelings. A story that made us cry this much needs to be read. The English version is available freely, it's only a bit of time, and it's very well worth it. You might need to fuck around with your graphics settings to get it to display in proper 4x3 if you want to play it in full screen without it stretching to 16x9, but still, very, very worth it. Probably one of the best pieces of queer fiction that we've ever read, on top of all the other best pieces of queer fiction that we've ever read, and the fact that it got translated the year after its release is incredible. It also has a sequel called Sugi no Terasu, which is probably not called Sunshine in English because that's not what the kanji means. This sequel never got any sort of digital release, either officially or otherwise, and it looks as if the Dojin group that made it has long disbanded, given that the web domain name they used to occupy is now populated by casino advertisements, so all their work is probably just kind of gone unfortunately. As is often the case when independently produced niche media exists, and no one is doing any work to preserve it, these things just sort of go and vanish. Unless it hasn't vanished, and someone does care. Like, I don't know, the girl reading this. I don't know about you all, but I'd prefer this 13-year-old VN that's a sequel to a 16-year-old VN about a trans girl gets to be read by someone, and hopefully continue to exist, and not evaporate into the mists of time. Sure, we can't read it, yet, but details details. We'll learn how to read, I hope. Thinking this thusly, I began the search, and after a modicum of Google searching, I found a copy of Sugi no Terasu for sale on Akibao. Presumably, this copy's used, and there's no guarantee it'll work with our computer or that it won't be scratched to hell. But hey, you have to take some chances sometime in life. So I bought it, with a portion of our, uh, meager monthly Patreon earnings, so that we can collect it and take some form of action to preserve it in some form. Because this is what we're supposed to do. I know we don't have that much money, I know we're probably going to have to eat a lot of rice for another month, but what the hell are we doing this YouTube shit for, if not this shit? And I, for one, am tired of watching Hazel do all the awesome Japanese media preservation actions. I would like to have some of that glory somehow. And that's the thing. So, if you'd like to support the thing, that is to say, acquiring and assessing niche subcultural Japanese media so that we can talk about it and maybe help make it accessible to other people, and making video essays about these exploits and our emotional discoveries from them, or whatever else we do, which all apparently comes ahead of eating a proper diet because we're insane, then please, please donate money to us via Kofi 
Ko-fi, Patreon, or whatever. You will be rewarded in some way, I assure you. Unless you don't feel rewarded, and then you won't. So here, I'm gonna tell you all about other interesting content we have had a look at. Number two, Gundam, the witch from Mercury. Really, I think you should just look at the tweet that I wrote, which says, So basically this is the story of what would happen if us talking to girls in our Discord chats, but we had mechas and were all caught in the middle of corporate slash government space politics warzing. I'm sorry. <laughs> And also, Suleta didn't do anything wrong. I've thought about this quite a long time, and others have kind of said it more succinctly, but I think that Suleta made, if not the best decision, a reasonable decision in this circumstance to protect her fiancé from the guy pointing a gun at her. I think the appropriate thing to do then would have been to emerge from Ariel, apologizing profusely for the traumatic experience that Mirine just had of watching a dude get killed, instead of what Suleta did do. That would have been the human thing to do. But Suleta didn't act like a human in this situation because her mom told her, effectively, that this behavior is a show of emotional strength. And that's what happened here, and that's interesting because it plays really well into the story, I think, in showing that the shonen protagonist pluckiness that Suleta was trying to approach her circumstances with doesn't really work all of the time. Suleta, the main protagonist of this series, acted the most protagonist that she'd ever acted in this scene, and it was the most out of character she'd ever acted, and also the most in character she'd ever acted, and like, gosh, 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 gosh. I'm looking forward to seeing how they follow up on this. That's really what I have to say about that. Oh, um, and and also the, the show was good, so yeah, that helped. Number three, how do we relationship? Which I'm going to refer to as Sukiyage, a shortened form of its Japanese title from here on out. Sukiyage is a story about lesbians. And yes, yes, I know, there's many stories about lesbians that we've told you about before. Now, this isn't like those. Sukiyage is about lesbians. Sukiyage is about the experience of being a lesbian in this world with all its gross bigotry problems. Sukiyage is about the experience of being in a group of heterosexual women and being asked what guys you like and being unable to answer honestly. Sukiyage is about the experience of being someone you know that your parents would hate. Sukiyage is about the experience of being a teenager with no adults to trust in your life, and also about being an adult uncertain if you can trust the other adults in your life, and about the ennui of living isolated in a place you'll probably never find your way out of, and about <coughs> cough cough. Sukiyage is about two twenty-something lesbians who date each other because they're the only lesbians they know and they have no idea what else to do, and who are also really good at having a lot of sex with each other, but are also really bad at dating, and even worse at dating on the days when they're really bad at having sex with each other, and they're both also young and both had traumatic high school romance failures, because being a high school student is plenty traumatic in its own ways, and those wounds are still fresh to both of them, even if they want to pretend they aren't, and it's bound to follow them still, and this life, this town they've lived their whole life in, and it's just a lot of spicy drama about that. I've been only three volumes in so far, and Miwa and Saiko are the first main pairing of a Yuri manga we've read, to whom I've kind of ended up saying nope. I don't get the sense that these two are made for each other in the same sense we got reading Adashima, or Yagakimi, or Sasakoi. They argue, they bicker, they feel jealous about each other, and about maybe two-thirds of the way through the second volume, I realized I was reading a breakup narrative. I mean, look at the back covers of the first four volumes, they telegraph it visually. But also, that makes this manga even more compelling for what it's going for, because, um, conflict is good, and two people not made for each other is damn well better. Just, yes, please do try to eventually get these two back together, and 
sell me on this horrible relationship sorting itself. Or don't, that's also fine. I'm not actually got to the chapter where they broke up because gosh, and tough, and yeah. And also, this is probably the first manga I've read that actually shows how school can be traumatic when it presents a supporting character who was deemed gifted in high school but ultimately wasn't as good as their sibling and then was extremely othered by their family and that just is and then just is generally awfully maladjusted to reality in adulthood because of the sheltered and overstructured way in which they lived being forced to rank as high as possible on exams and like shit like, I know Japanese high school is brutal, and it's a plot point in a lot of anime and all, but this is the one time I can recall offhand when it was actually something that impacted the story and characters outside of a relatively contained studying arc, and it's probably some of the realest fucking shit I've ever read. Also, um, Sukiyage is really damn funny. Like, the early volumes had me laughing involuntarily so much that I was seriously concerned about attracting noise complaints from others in our living space, or around, generally. It, it's a really good story, and the art and faces are really good, the humor is really good, and that's pretty damn essential, I think, for a story that deals in such heavy topics. The whole thing is good, so yeah, read it. 4. Bad End Theater So yeah, I already used this game as b-roll in the Adashima video. If you watched that, you probably already know that we liked this, and we do. It's quite good. This game starts with, as Joyce said, uh, An unawakened lesbian is eaten by a demon, and in the next part of the game, the lesbian meets a demon lesbian who wants to eat her in the other way. And in the later part of the game, a reply guy apologizes for replying with violence. Or actually replies with violence. <laughs> so anyway, uh, this game took us a couple hours to 100% all its Steam achievements. Very short game, very good game, nice little queer vignette about the tragedy of people from different social backgrounds not understanding each other, and then understanding each other, one hopes. It's not free, but it's, it's quite good and easily recommendable. So yeah. 5. Spark the Electric Jester 3. It's a Sonic game. It's basically a Sonic game. It's much like the earlier game, Spark the Electric Jester 2, which is much like the earlier games, Sonic Adventure 2 and Shadow the Hedgehog, the video about which we were going to make, is apparently not coming out until it does, because we keep getting distracted by pointless bullshit. The developer of this series is a former developer of Sonic fan games and started with the 2D Spark the Electric Jester 1, which we could not finish because we suck at 2D platformers. One really interesting thing about the game is how it treats the live system. Yes, it has one, but only for the final level. I find this super interesting because while we were playing the Sonic Adventure titles with a friend of ours, we kind of generally came into the agreement that the live system of all these games was a mistake. And Sonic Team seems to have agreed because they uh, removed it from Sonic Forces onwards. But Spark 3 puts it back deliberately only for the final level. And the final level is basically designed to make you lose lives. Not through difficulty, exactly, because while it is difficult, it's not insurmountable. Once you know the lay of the land, but rather, through compounding difficulty by length, Utopia Shelter doesn't feel exactly like a level. It feels like a whole city. It feels like, I suppose, if at the end of Sonic 06, the whole of Soliana became a level from which Sonic had to escape? Oh, wait, that, that, that did happen. It was the whole game. Sorry, just, um, uh, I mean, I mean if the, 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 the whole of Soliana became a level at the end of a good Sonic 06. Um, Sonic 06 is cool? I'm very sorry to say so. It's a horrible mess, but it also is cool. Anyway, Spark 3's acknowledgement of lives as a part of the Sonic Adventure experience feels like, kind of great. Like, it doesn't just go, oh, 
this part annoyed people. Let's throw it away. It says, no. Dying in final chase repeatedly and falling out to the main menu is part of this kind of game. Let's just give the player a chance to experience that at least once. Let's make this a part of the game, but make the level earn it. Make it better, both by being an awesome level whose difficulty feels contextually justified, and also by being in a game with phenomenal 3D controls and platforming and movement physics where the appeal of such a difficulty modifier isn't spoiled by deaths that don't feel like your fault, and it's done in a way that feels accessible with the option of going back and just playing more of the game more if you feel like you'd need more lives to endure the stage, but odds are if you've done all the optional stages, you don't need that many. I got to the end of Utopia Shelter on the second try, with lives to spare. And yeah, so anyway, Spark 3, it's a really good game. It's got a pretty great level design and a great sense of visual style. Really good music, good movement, except for those damn cars that glitch and start going sideways all the time. I started just doing the car stages on foot because I couldn't be bothered. But other than those, great game. And finally, Bochi the Rock. Okay, uh, so I'm not sure what about Bochi I can say that isn't already said by other people, but you know what, fuck it. Molly's convinced me. I'm gonna tell the weird age gap crush story. So, when we were like 16, 17, thereabouts, we were presumed a cis boy, and about six entire feet, and because of this, non-attentive members of the audience would often mistake us for a college-age dude. This factor, alongside the color of our skin and the general, uh, emotional neglect of our parents, lent itself to our delinquencies, i.e. doing basically whatever the fuck we wanted, at the expense of getting verbally and or physically harassed by our parents, who weren't happy with us doing whatever the fuck we wanted, but were slowly giving up at after whatever point they stopped paying for the therapy that didn't fix this brain immediately. So, it was one night, while we were out of the house, as we usually were, talking to people at a charity event for the community org we volunteered for back then, that we saw her. That woman who played guitar, who was back then about the age we are right now, maybe a little bit older, don't think I need to describe her elsewise really. We had played guitar too, once, for several years even, but I think we'd given up on music like the year before, after our mom harassing us to practice the right way made it not fun for us anymore. Seeing that beautiful, talented, very nice woman almost made us want to try again, although we didn't because our mom didn't want us to ever touch an instrument again unless we were truly serious about trying to make money with it eventually, because those lessons are expensive, and I guess that's one of the many ways we disappointed her by ostensibly wasting her money. But anyway, Guitar Woman. She was nice. That's most of what we remember about her. She was nice, cool, and to our eyes then, a pretty older woman who felt easy to talk to. and seemed to empathize with our anxieties, as little of them as we felt comfortable telling, and we were awkward around her and didn't say much other than to compliment her and to talk about Edgar Wright's movies, but like, you know, she was good. She was good. Remembering how she smiled and how she looked at us like, well, probably the same as she smiled and looked at everyone, but still, it seemed like she liked us, or liked having us around, or at least didn't hate us. And now, being a performing person, we understand it's kind of in your best interest to smile at everyone who comes to see a show, but yeah. And we knew we never had a chance with this nice older woman and that our crush on her was inappropriate, but still, we thought about this nice, talented, pretty, interesting woman and how much we wished we could be closer with her, but alas, and curses, age gaps strike something again, our heart most likely, but maybe something else too. And you know where this is going, don't you? Yeah. Hikuri Hiroi is far, far more unhinged than that woman. The woman we knew was hinged enough to not drink around the absurdly tall and cute 17-year-old that kept coming to her gigs for 
unknown reasons. Kikuri, meanwhile, is hardly ever seen without a bottle or a can of sake nearby. And she's also a bit more, you know, open with Hitori-chan, whose face around Kikuri is constantly a mixture of mild terror and grand astonishment. And yes, Seika and Kikuri is definitely the more appropriate ship, and the one more likely to happen in the actual story if any explicit lesbianism did happen, which I don't expect it to. But Hitori and Kikuri, in my opinion, is much more compelling, precisely because of how inappropriate it is. There's just something compelling to us anyway, and the thought of our dead-in-the-water teenage crush or something adjacent to it actually going someplace. It's true that had we acted on it in real life, assuming we weren't just rejected and told to abscond permanently, it'd almost certainly have gone extremely badly for all the reasons it'd have done that. But you know, fiction is meant for exploring those culturally taboo fantasies of those sorts without necessarily needing to consider those unsafe and undesirable consequences. Although you can, because that's conducive to drama. So anyway, as far as the actual show goes, I don't know, I think it's all pretty clear in this moment, this entire surreal bit with the psychedelic rock concert where Hitori sees Kikuri reach out to her in this imagined intimate moment and whisk her away through this weird and new aspect of music and life experience that she's not felt before. And it's just like, yeah, yeah, that's how it felt to us back then, watching that nice older woman on that stage. It was really kind of nostalgic, actually. So there's one layer of the appeal of Kikuri's inclusion in the show, Kitori's feelings for Kikuri as someone who is a mentor figure and has things to teach her, whether you think that's music or something else. And though Hitori isn't eloquent or brave enough to articulate whatever her crazy teenage feelings are, it's clear she has some, which are ambiguous enough that they could be interpreted as just her wanting to be like Kikari, which was also an aspect of our wild teenage emotions about our cool guitar woman, or that Kikuri playing in front of her triggered a spicy homosexual awakening. Not wrong either way, though I think it's both. And the other layer of the appeal is just, well, Kikuri herself, and our adoration of and relation to Kikuri is not just a stand-in for her teenage age gap crush, but also as a character in our age range who is relatable to us as a young adult who feels similarly to her about life. I don't think I need to explain that one, but I will anyway. Kikuri is an alcoholic. At some point after we turned 21, it wasn't us, but Joyce. Joyce discovered alcohol during one of the low points in our life when we were unstably housed and gradually started to rely on it a fair bit more than she should have. For a good year or two there, Joyce was drinking off her ass about once a month, sometimes twice, and you know, just sort of thinking, who cares? If I die, if I lose, if I go out, who cares? Because I'm not going to. We only really stopped drinking as much as we did because it started costing money and we started finding ostensibly better ways to hurt ourselves, like buying the disc of an ancient Japanese-only doujin game and telling ourselves it's media preservation. I don't think we were ever as much of an addict as Kikuri, but just watching Kikuri and watching her ruin her own life in basically the exact same sort of way is extremely relatable and gross and ugh. And the whole gosh contrast of this woman being Hitori's mentor figure, who she takes her cues from, and then embarrassing herself trying to do it. It's just incredible and perfect and gosh. Both these lovely women are both ruining themselves, trying to be cool and likable and, and awesome and succeeding because the, the people like the woman ruining themselves. And it's beautiful! <sighs> I'm sorry. It's beautiful. Anyway, Bochi good. Bochi good. We've been reading the manga of Bochi since writing that bit, and I think the Bochi manga is just for one thing somewhat inherently let down by not being an anime and not having songs play in it, but it's got a bit more humor, at least one more crazy adult, and it's got more happening in it, as there is in every manga, and I really like it. 
I also like how it goes about, you know, putting forth the general thesis or idea that, you know, um, quote, rock touches people's hearts because it's coming from a loser, but you can't call it rock if it's from a successful person. Because that's a, that's a statement to make. That's a statement that I'm kind of into, because we're very not successful, and uh, seeing, seeing characters like Kikuri and Bochi and, you know, and her underground band, and uh, characters like Aiko and her shady underground journalism and just the, the fact that the manga presents all of them, all of these very unsuccessful women as cool because they are cool and that's real rock. <laughs> and you know, but also please donate to our Patreon. <laughs> And one thing that I'm, one thing that I, one other thing that I really like about the manga is that it, it focuses so much, it, it's like, it's not so school-centric as a lot of other manga about, you know, music teenagers tend to be. Like, they're not the light music club, they're, they're, a, they're a real underground band, and, you know, that's, that's freaking cool. <laughs> that they are, they are, you know, actually doing concerts for money. And that's, you know, it's about doing the concerts for money and about working with adults who also have been doing concerts for money and drugs. <laughs> it's like the fact that so little of it is set inside the school, like, you know, the, the one moment where, like, the, the, the online journalist writer who is just, like, spotlighting, who's, you know, writing about bands and looking for Hitori, and then she goes to the school and she's just, like, kicked out of the school because she's not- she's- she's a creep who doesn't belong in the school, and... <laughs> And then, you know, in like another manga where it's the Light Music Club, that that'd just that'd just kind of be where the plot stops. Where that plot line stops. But she but then she finds out that, you know, they don't perform at school because they're not a school band. And then she goes to the live house and advances the plot. And is also a kind of fucked up, self-interested woman who tries to sequester Hitori into d d d d because she's she's interested in money and promising more than she's probably able to able able to give she is this this chapter is this this is a scene where this is a scene where this woman tries to buy Bochi by Hitori with the promise of exposure <laughs> That is literally, that is the literal description! <laughs> okay, I'm done ad-libbing. One thing I wanted out of the anime, watching the anime, was to see the group grow and expand to the point where they actually do become a famous and successful band. That's basically what I figured it had for, since Hitori is already a successful YouTuber, as YouTubers go. And since Nijika said that's where she wanted it to go, that she wants the band to grow and become popular and help everyone reach their dreams, we kind of do have the whole high schoolers become music celebrities thing in Love Live, but I'd love to see that thing done in a way that feels more grounded and believable, where people actually seem to worry about money outside of the fantasy confines of a nationally famous school club, and have it done in a way that the story doesn't stop happening once they graduate. Given how much the story already features adults in supporting roles, who are implied to be varying levels of fucked up just as well and seriously as its teenage characters, who are implied to be varying levels of micro-fucked up, it feels like the sort of story that's kind of made to transition to follow these girls out of their school lives, and I hope it goes there. And I also hope that the anime eventually gets further seasons, because the material of the later manga chapters has itself a fantastic foundation if the rest of it is adapted in the same way, so yeah. Although my greatest fear in that regard is that Aniplex will, you know, see the manga's popularity and try to rush it as quick as possible, and then, you know, pass it off to a different team that is forced to rush it, and that would, then it's a, then it's the One Punch Man Season 2 problem, and that'd not be, not be amazing. That's a, I mean, that's a capitalism problem, you know that. 
And that's just the feelings I have on that. If you're more interested in more Bochi content, then um, Sakuga has a couple write-ups and translated interviews which talk about the production, which is itself its own really interesting story. It also got us to read the manga, because the way that the anime's character designer expresses such passion for Hamaji's work is utterly palpable, and gosh things. Also, I think it's really funny that Kara Riera decided to animate the Bochi ice bath scene with her wearing a school swimsuit, because that adds another deeper layer of hilarious cringe that isn't quite present in the manga version of the scene. When you see that she's so mentally conflicted about the merits and demerits of this scheme that she can't bring herself to fully expose her own body to the ice water, which would probably make the intended effect of catching a cold more likely and thus make the plan work better. And also the scene probably couldn't have become as much of a Twitter meme if they'd decided to illustrate her without the school swimsuit like the manga does. Since then, everyone would be mentally and sometimes textually debating the merits and demerits of bath scenes in anime again. Except it'd be funnier than that because it'd be about this scene and that would be gosh darn hilarious. I think that's really kind of it for this one. Where out of time! So we'll see everyone next time, and thanks to our patrons. Bree, Dorian Newlin, Hikari no Yume, El Tantivy, Pigeon, Sally, Scimitar, and Tiss. And everybody else. Oh wow, that was that was uh, that was almost 48 minutes. Okay, um